Welcome back to another episode of the Collective Evolution Podcast. Today, my guest is Lubomir Arsav. Lubomir is a artist and storyteller working as an animation writer and director. His personal work explores the psychological, parapolitical, and spiritual dynamics that define the momentous times that we are collectively navigating here. In 2017, he released his first award-winning animated film called In Shadow, A Modern Odyssey. You might remember that one. It was very popular. And that film explored the fragmented unconsciousness of our times back then, which is still very relevant today. Professionally, he has also worked in various phases of production and IP development for both major and boutique animated studios on a variety of film and TV projects for clients like Netflix, Warner Brothers, Blue Sky, Mattel, Disney, House of Cool, among many others. His latest projects include directing the reimagined He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, the dystopian sci-fi short film called Forest King, and his latest upcoming film called Kingdom. I had a great conversation with Lubomir about a number of different topics that are both related to his films and our current moment. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode, so let's dive in. Well, Lubo, it's good to have you on the show for the first time here. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Joel. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm kind of thinking where to start in a sense because uh, you know I first came in contact with your work many years ago when I when I wrote an article about In Shadow. But just before we get talking about that a little bit, maybe can you kind of just offer a bit of a background as to what you do and uh, what inspired some of the work that we're going to talk about here today? For sure. Um, yeah, you've been like one of the OGs and championing In Shadow way back when it came out in like <laughs> 2017, and I think you tapped into it then or 2018, but. What I do in general, and I'll speak uh, here strictly about my personal work, you know, outside of my professional work, which is has been servicing bigger studios and move and animated films, TV series, etc., development uh, of IPs. Strictly, what I'm doing now, more and more so, uh, with my personal work, is exploring what is uh, immediately interesting and immediately pulls me and inspires me, uh, and translating that into storytelling, uh, especially in the form of visceral audio visual experiences and the intention here is to translate my current understanding which is constantly evolving in a format that then can be the inspiration the understanding the the sense of the world that i have the sense of self that i have uh, translating that into various symbolic representations and translating that to uh to something that can infuse people with uh, either insight or one would hope somewhat of a transformative experience through art. Yeah. Nice. Well said. And I mean, there's so much to pick up on there with, in, in terms of even just the conversation of art and, and the transformative experience there and um, what feels like sort of differences in art from the past and art today, which some, to some extent feels a little bit devoid of, of some of that. And I do want to talk about that um, at some point, but what I, what I want to kind of go back to is this moment of, I came across your first film that you made, um, animation film, in uh, 2017. It was the release, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was called In Shadow. And I remember seeing that and speaking of the word visceral, you know, you, you mentioned visceral in, in the way you try and create this art. I mean, I remember having such a visceral experience watching this, kind of sensing and feeling into this almost dystopian type world that's being presented but there's a there's an element of reclamation of something deeper something sacred something in the sense of an awakening that, that sort of emerges as the film goes on but i'd love for you to kind of sort of lay out what this project in shadow meant to you and and why like as a starting point why you created it yeah so there are a few layers to what it meant to me and why i created it one is uh a personal level of expression and frustration and a second one is a greater mission and an uh, inspired calling so i was in service to both of those and i was um looping in and out of each one uh the personal one f was was harnessing my talents and skills for something that was useful and meaningful to me and expressing my inner world in a way that I couldn't verbally, uh, despite you know an increasing verbal acuity and skill, still something about the, the nature of the realm we live in required more. And my particular skill in visual storytelling seemed to be able to do that. 
the second part of that is the greater calling and inspiration in which I felt that um, something of what I was seeing and what I wanted to convey, it wasn't clear, it was an experiment, but I thought that it may offer um, somewhat of a roadmap into the gritty and stormy territory that I intuited we were moving into. And it's not like just my intuition. There's, you know, the people around me and the general culture, those of, a who, those of us who were, dare I say, on the vanguard of like anticipating <laughs> certain world changes and seeing the collective uh, hero's journey. I felt that uh, the greater mission of this art piece was to provide a catalyst for really shaking people out and being like, look, we got to go through some stormy territory and we will be going through it. And here's somewhat of a of a framework of what's happening. The, some things we may not have looked at personally and collectively, starting to integrate those, and and then offering a small window near the end of where we may be going through the dissolution, through the fracturing, through the crumbling of old, and what it may mean to start considering and conceptualizing the new, but created through choice, not through blind um, inheritance of past structures. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's well said. There's a lot there. Um, I, I'm thinking maybe what, just to, to continue catching up the, the listeners here, what does In Shadow tell the story of in your perspective? Good question. It tells the story of a realm of existence populated by human beings. Um, who are living through a malaise, a dream of sorts, which is self-created through, um, through a refraction of confusion, and I'll just call it in general unconsciousness, through which life is refracted through all of these, uh, all this cultural static, and is confused with what real, real what reality is and what authentic experience of being a human is. In addition to that, collective complicity of human beings. It also proposes the idea, I mean, it's not, not a new idea, but it's one that is, there is, a, there is an order of, of a, quote unquote authorities in our world, um, which are more and more visible now, which have been imposing their own self-interests on uh, the collective and thus interfering with the greater harmony and greater positive experience of humanity on this world. Uh, so it's yeah. the story of that dynamic of the personal and collective uh, imprisonment of each other that we do and the, the, the manner in which that could be broken down, renewed, and the whole realm can be redeemed. Yeah. Yeah. And I know there's, you know, going back to that visceral experience, you have, you have such a, a, a beautiful sort of imagery, symbolism and sound that sort of guides this story. Um, along and I, I really think about the symbolism when I think about you know the, the the ways in which when I first watched this it really hit me and, and I think about things like you know throughout the course of it there's these, these boxes around people's head these red boxes um, that are sort of like you know sort of containing our minds in a sense and we see that through the education system part of that goes on we see that through you know media part of that happens right um, I'd be curious if you can kind of break down some of the key pieces of symbolism that are shown throughout the film and maybe just touch on, on you know, what that meant to you as you were trying to convey it. Yeah, sure. Let's see what I can actually remember of this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the red boxes. Let's start, with, let's start with the red boxes, yeah. Yeah, no, the very, very emblematic uh, red boxes, which are, yeah, a very useful metaphor. So, you know, when I work with these things, a lot of it comes from an intuitive sense of what I feel and what I'm trying to portray. In addition to that, then uh, when it's corroborated by outside wisdom or knowledge or information, then I know I have a powerful symbol. So in this case, the red box has just felt like an enclosure which created a filter through in, in, in a form of um, a conceptual filter of reality, uh, some sort of conceptual structure. So that's any belief system or ideology, especially a, a disempowering one, really, because those are the ones that bind. So which... Um, Mm -hmm. which filters what actually is. And so having, you know, that with the cube, which is in many, in, in many traditions or in the esoteric traditions, a representation of matter 
a representation of a co collapse and sort of limited structure. It's not a bad thing. It just gives form and it gives limitations to consciousness for various reasons. Again, not a bad thing, but when we're aware of the dynamic of a certain limiting forces, then we can start having more choices in how we how we function within those. So the square box is really, in the simplest term, a, yeah, just a reality construct. Um, yeah. Then we have stuff like, did you want to say anything about that? Yeah, not? I was just, I just before we go on to masks, I would love to go on to the masks next, if you don't mind. But um, yeah. just to, to sort of recap that, are you sort of suggesting that it's the awareness, awareness of the boxes, it's the awareness of the constructs that we live within that kind of give us the freedom to actually see where we are playing, where we are biasing and where we can kind of expand our choices. That's, that's what I'm hearing here. Um, and so the message might be that, do we want to transcend the box or do we do want to be aware of, of the box? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So when I made it, I would have said we want to transcend the box. Now I feel that I've added more understanding to this construct. And as I, as I and all of us continue to, uh, you know, deepen our understanding, I would say it's more of knowing and understanding the construct because we're always under some sort of construct, right? There's no, yeah. in this realm, it's very difficult to have any true freedom because then that's an abstraction that is not tethered to any sort of, um, we need pillars of, of reality, right, to attach to. And it's just mm -hmm. like, yeah. which guiding philosophy are we choosing to be under? Um, it's which structure and which rules are we choosing to function under. Now, if we don't even know that there are any structures or that we're functioning under any rules, then that's unconscious living. So, yeah, I think it's about that yeah. choice of going to higher and higher, more inspired structures, more of the spiritual hierarchies and celestial hierarchies as opposed to the earthbound material limited, you know, uh, closed human culture structures. Yeah. 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 Well said. Yeah. And in, in, in my work, I talk a lot about, the, you know, sort of getting to these, whether we want to call them biases or these cognitive constructs, we've kind of played with this concept of embodied sense making, which really looks at this idea of, of feeling and sensing and being within the body and the faculties and the ways in which we relate, the ways in which we come with this sense of curiosity and exploration and, and in good faith toward seeing the resistances that we have when we're looking at our world or not wanting to open up to new ideas, right? When we can sense and feel those resistances and we're aware of them, it's only then that we can kind of ease that resistance, right? And then, and then see where it takes us beyond that, right? But when we're so closed off and then we're defending, right? We're defending our construct, we're defending our idea. I think this is kind of the unconsciousness that, that you're referring to. Yeah, totally. This is such a good point because, you know, you, you and I have, obviously I have this like ongoing dialogue about this and it's the emerging kind of like the most important aspect of all of this is having our own personal agency and navigating this realm based on our own targets and, um, and intentions. Just so, just like you said, if we're trying to protect something or guard it, um, there's already some sort of lack. There's, um, I think in general, if we slow down and like you said, curiosity is such an important tool but to slow down and have curiosity to feel and to actually be in touch and interface with what is happening here now and start um, start experiencing things for ourselves as opposed to uh, kind of having inherited d uh, definitions of things. By doing so, we, um, we're not playing some sort of game of um, advertising the ego or playing safe in some sort of like certainty of how things are and guarding that premise. It's more like, yeah, the curiosity and the, 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 the ever growing confidence that there's something greater happening, that we are held in this something greater and that we can start relaxing into it and feeling it for what it is, as opposed to imposing what it should be. And then yeah. be playing incre games of increasing suffering and confusion. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. It's uh the, the deeper we kind of resist our resistance in a sense, like <laughs> resist the curiosity of exploring where the resistance is, the more suffering uh, emerges. And uh, that's definitely an interesting piece. I, I let's, why don't we move on to sort of the symbolism of masks? You use that quite a bit 
in in shadow with with various forms of masks that people already have or that they put on uh, throughout the course of the animation. Uh, what was what was the masks symbolist uh, the symbolism of the masks in the animation there? Yeah, the mask symbol is another strong one, and it's a very overt symbol. Of course, it's almost like just in your face, <laughs> you know, yeah. like a verbatim uh, symbol. But it, we need to remind ourselves of these things. I need to remind myself of you know still there are very various masks that come on and off with me and and it's like sometimes they're useful when we use them consciously and they're not um denigrating or they're not like deceiving of anyone they're just part of being a human being having a human experience and playing with personality traits when we're conscious of that it can be a beautiful thing because it's how we interface with each other and but but the masks really here represent uh the unconscious the and um, often a very protective mechanism which guards the lower wound itself. So it's a, in here the mask is cert basically a strategy within the social economics that we play in which we exaggerate and invent certain traits which are not authentic to us or if they're authentic we embellish and, and make them, um, I would say even ugly and hideous. And uh, the more that we invest in the mask the heavier it becomes, the the more distanced we are from our authentic core, from our real impulses, and the more games of pretense and um, artificiality we have to play, and we lose track of what is real, what the real target is, uh, what is pleasure, what is uh, virtue, what is, all these things just uh, disappear because we're essentially hiding from the pain of who we haven't faced ourselves to be, it's formative pain, we can even call it ancestral pain, just the, the, the pain of feeling inadequacy in this world. And we mask it with um, more or less a narcissistic, self-important or sanctimonious or nice guy mask. You know, there, there's various, mm -hmm. various masks, the spiritual guy, the spiritual yoga girl, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you said something really interesting there, where the more we invest in this mask and it sounds like the mask can come from a, a number of different places within society, within our psyche, within um, how we might want to correct for things that we're feeling that we don't know how to process or deal with. Um, but, you know, in practical terms, like uh, for people to sort of explore this concept on a, on a very day to day life, w how could you expand upon investing in this mask and it becomes heavier? Yeah. So will we invest in it by basically having it starts with the impulse. One of the ways that it starts is with the impulse to, to, to get energy from others. And what I mean, get energy from others is that's in the form of validation to fill that which is unfulfilled within us. So, you know, you, you and I, like having been connected more to the Soma, I sense that as a, as actually an emptiness that uh, feels like something is not complete. And it's almost like, giving away that power to the abstract others and then creating some sort of traits so that the others can then give adulation, validation, uh, praise in all, all ways, right? And so the mask, uh, by investing more in it, it just means I am now investing in more behaviors and traits that are artificial to who I am, which... Um, which basically add more and more weight to this fake creation of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. And um, one of the other pieces within this, and maybe this relates, is, uh, you know, you have the sort of this dark gunk in the film. And, and I see this uh, too in, in Kingdom, the new one that you have coming out. There's so much uh, play within this um, almost like this dark gunk that's in essentially the heart center area, the, whether we want to call it the heart chakra, maybe it's just the heart in general that you're going to be referring to, but we see it there. We see it, we see it coming out, you know, in, in both in, in shadow and kingdom. I'm curious, what's the, what's the symbolism of that dark gunk? I mean, it is pretty obvious, but I, I'd be curious to hear the ways in which you talk about it. Yeah, totally. Let's see what words want to attach themselves to this concept. Yeah. <laughs> but like, 
Yeah, it's uh, again, it's one of those intuitive things where it feels like the center of the eye of the I amness is here, and then that's just clouded, uh, obstructed, and actually somewhat of a it's in a grotesque state of closure, and so it's in a profane state, right? It's not in a sacred state of open connection and uh, an emanation, a radiance of of my innermost being. It's more like um, something is wrong, and it's almost like something foreign is there. But it's also ours. So it's an obstruction of, of the goodness, the radiance of who I am. And it's a, the fog of consciousness, the fog of not knowing who I am. And therefore, I have to play these lower level games of the fallen culture. So it's, uh, it's you know, the way it's represented in, in Shadow and now in Kingdom is it's trauma. It's uh, le leftover misperceptions and distortions of myself, of the world. Uh, and when I say myself, it's just, you know, all of us. And it is uh, specifically in, in Shadow, we have it in these very grotesque and malevolent looking characters. Within them, that that smoke that comes out, the black smoke that comes from their hearts and their backs, to me, um, felt like an influence that probably began with personal unprocessed hurt that was so repressed that then became a portal for other you know going more into fantasy land but it's also like there's a reality to this which is a uh, other aberrant sort of like hostile energies that can latch onto that whether those are personal complexes that are separate or they're actually discarnate entities and you know of course we get in juicy territory here and <laughs> yeah. it's like more fantastical but like yes that is that's also a portal for that 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 kind of energy yeah and yeah. you know we see this we see this energy in 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 suits in the movie um uh, often referring to those in positions of power whether it be political or um uh let's say financial corporate or whether it be even from a media perspective and um i, I kind of want to bring in a, a couple other terms as i build this sort of question here it's like we're, we're seeing this darkness we're seeing this in the higher parts of society um you mentioned fallen culture and, and sort of how the culture has fallen um, is was some of the words you used. And within that too, there's this, this sort of idea that um, it's, I'm, I'm trying to like really put it into words because I, I kind of want you to comment on all this at once. It's this idea that their pain, the pain is the darkness. And, and it seems as though we've somehow, those that maybe carry some of the most pain have become the most influential in society. And I, I'd be curious if you could touch on all of that uh, bit of soup that I pulled together there. Yeah, no, it's an interesting, it's a tasty soup, which obviously I like exploring. And it's like, <laughs> it's, I, I, I agree with you. So that, that premise that we're unfolding here, that unprocessed pain leads to possibly greater atrocities toward oneself and toward the world. Right, because mm -hmm. there's a shallowness of felt of a felt sense of what is here, and therefore, when we don't access what is there, we have to we have to surf more and more shallow bandwidths of emotion and experience, and then that leaves us out of touch with the whole spectrum of existence. And of course, it does because we can't access that painful part. It would crumble who we think we are, the structure, the mask what brings the safety of this like persona that's like separated and just trying to exist. And so, you know, why does that happen now? Why has it always happened? I mean, I don't know how I, I do feel like there have has been, you know, as an ancient past, I do feel that that perhaps was a uh, more oriented toward virtue and, uh, you know, a greater order of uh, hierarchical descent of, 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 you know, source, let's say, of mm -hmm. God coming down. Um, so I feel that something about maybe it's the aspect of the Kali Yuga we're in, just the conscious evolution cycle that we may be in, but something about that has really broken down the um, organizational structure of society and culture, right? So that we're not, we're not, our society is not built upon meritocracy of values or yeah. virtues. We parade that, we pretend that that's the case, but that is not so. And something about that breakdown, whether it happened by just within the conscious space we are in right now, or whether it happened by less and less involvement by the population within the structure of governance, 
whether it's by disowning our own inner power, which is then reflected from the outside as a structure that seems to impose its power on us to reflect to us where we're giving it up, or it's uh, or it's just the time we're in in which um, those who actually care about power, they don't care about leadership or guidance or or really taking care of the realm. Instead, mm -hmm. they care about... Um, control it looks like and i'm here i'm you know inferring from just the actions that we've been seeing more and more clearly yeah um they they seem to care about control and suppressing anything that is more alive more free and self-organizing so that they can feel in control and maintain their pain suppressed <laughs> and, <laughs> right uh and and um and kind of yeah i'll just leave it at that yeah no, 100%. I, what I'm sort of taking from that is this idea of, of something that I think many of us, probably people listening to this podcast too, really see. And I, I think it's it's seen in your, your in shadow as well as kingdom, which um, I want to talk about a little bit further. But, you know, it's this thing that I feel has been driving so much of my work too, which is it feels as though society and, and we're kind of going through the motions and there's an emptiness. There's a there's a sense of a loss of the sacred, a loss of something that is as deeper. You refer to it as kind of this source that would be trickling down um, from from a god or from from something that we might be connected to that's greater than ourselves in a sense. And when I when I see that in a very practical way in society, I'm I'm seeing like the defense of capitalism, right? And um, we're defending it with words that actually don't represent the lived experience. So you you, you mentioned like. You know, we, we, we say meritocracy, we say that these things are important in culture, but they're actually not, right? We say we live in a democracy, we say capitalism is great, we say, but it's, it's all actually not, right? Um, and I think this, I'd be curious if you could comment on this. We're, it's almost like we're looking at it at such a mental cognitive level, at such an ideological level, and we're missing that deeper sensing into what is actually here, what are we actually living in? what is actually sacred in all of this. It's easy to go on YouTube and make a 4 million view video defending capitalism, but is there any spirit in that or is it just empty words? And, uh, you know, I'd be curious uh, y your take on that, that loss of sacred, that loss of spirit. Yeah, man, this is such an important topic. I'm glad you brought it up. Absolutely, that's exactly what it is and which is why, let's see, I want to be concise with this because there's so many ways to take it, but I want to, I, I'd love to plug it into AI because this has to do with AI, right? Because mm. the greater, so, you know, you have been championing embodiment through nervous system regulation and all these like vital things now for, for years. And that is the key right now for us to be in touch with matter and occupy it. And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. embodying and taking claim of our biology and through that our sense perceptions and therefore our environment. If we don't do that, then we, we remain stuck here in these abstractions, adopting other people's rules, other people's games, and playing by those rules. So a whole bunch of egregores and other things that we're tapping into, right? These constructs. When we're in the body, when we start purifying, going into the unconscious aspects that come up and start bringing in more consciousness and awareness, we start expanding in this field and this slowness of the now, and that's when we can encounter what is real beyond the refraction of the conceptual but because so much of our culture and this is where there may be a bifurcation there may be a redemption that's happening on we'll see a lot of us are doing that work to ground to go into reality and yet a lot of our other culture is being pulled up out into yeah, these yeah. more and more abstract games of like aberrant symbols and other mm -hmm. things and just like signaling at things without actually mm -hmm. having any substance yeah, yeah. to them and why I want to tie this to AI is because I'm sensing, intuiting for the last number of years, I've been seeing how AI is a logical outgrowth and a conclusion of this very disembodied thinking, very mind-based um, shared delusion that we're in. And AI is a natural outgrowth that it's, it's just all these incentive loops and automated processes and data processing that doesn't really, at this point in my understanding, doesn't really have spirit in an organic form that's connected to source at all times, not locally, right? Um, and so AI is almost like this 
potentially, uh, again, this could be good and bad, and it, it will be both in my opinion, but the bad part of it is it's going to be a prison of consciousness in which our already mechanized processes when we're in our own shadow are going to be ever more mechanized and incentivized yeah. to structures of governance as we know with the technocratic push. So it's very interesting how reality is mirroring to us where our, our collective conscious like consciousness is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you, t yeah, you touched on so many great reflections there. Um, just this idea of the, the, let's say the over intellectualizing, it's sort of like what, what good is the intellect if the intellect is not grounded in spirit and in the body and, and sort of having that reciprocal relationship. You know, um, I think Ian McGilchrist talks about this as the merging of the left and right hemisphere, um, which is, you know, the parts of, of achieving and, and that sort of mind, um, which is very much necessary in our world, but then also the, the, that which is in touch with the complexity, the interrelation, the, the sacredness, and, and having those merge in a sense. And I, I think we're seeing a society that is very, very much just left dominant and viewing everything that it's um, creating and stewarding from this left dominant point of view. And so this is where the emptiness comes in, right? We can say something, oh yes, this concept is so great and this and whatever, but are we actually embodying and, and emanating that in our actions at a deeper level and I think this is sort of the invitation here is to to go deeper into that and I think without that um, it's like we're missing out on a whole slew of what it means to be human what it means to engage with our environment what it means to be part of nature <laughs> like this is fascinating we've we've separated ourselves from nature and um, my thought is is you pointed out AI as this sort of this natural emergent phenomenon of this mechanical society. And I, I see it that way as well. And I also see it as, well, this has the potential to do some really important things. However, you know, what is the consciousness? What is the being? What is the collective being that's stewarding it, right? Um, and I think that's, uh, that's one of the big challenges here is, is how do we build that, that stewardship towards merging that in right and, and and merging in the spirit into the and how we use things i'd be curious if you have any thoughts on that oh the big questions yeah of course i mean it, it all has to it has to go into solutions right so we've been it's interesting we've been in this and we still will be in this age of uh revealing for some time as various levels of our humanity like catch up to what's going on and we all figure it out in various layers you know, like we all have a lot of catching up to do. And at the same time, we start, we have to start being active and proactive instead of passive writers of this whole stream of occurrence mm -hmm. and manifestation of reality. We have to start being active nodes of like live real players, player ones. And so yeah. I think like that's what I'm hearing you ask is like, or bring up, you know, and uh, I think that's all of us here in this space are considering all these issues and tackling all the emergent um, strangeness that's coming up and like how do we harmonize that into a vision forward and an action forward and it's interesting because we're in this space where we we to use that word inherited again we have inherited a culture and a way of being from our past and that's not a bad thing uh, because we have mm -hmm. to do that we're human beings under the laws of physics and the laws of spirit and the laws of many laws that we're under right and so um we inherit a lot of beautiful things like roads and shelter and sewage and like those are great structures that we're constantly inheriting and also ways of living and being in reality it's just that so much of that has somehow collapsed into egregores of institutions and structures of of governance that have become so aberrant so malicious and a lot of those bureaucracies don't realize it because like our parents and neighbors and relatives are part of these structures and bureaucracies and they're not evil people but they function under those rules because they don't know better and because of the momentum of life so right now we're seeing that something within all these processes is making everything sort of like evidently turn malicious evidently turn harmful and evidently turn corrupt and so it's more and more difficult to deny that and so that is leading to the collapse not only of trust of these institutions and structures but also of their inherent collapse under the weight of their own fallacies and 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 yeah. you know like just uh, strangeness and so here we're left with all we've known is the momentum of what we've inherited and um th those things are breaking down and now the question is like well shit, how what do we 
do in the future? How do we build these things? And, you know, it's part of it is like, yes, it'd be great for everything to just crumble so we can build a new, but that's not realistic, right? Like we have such yeah. complex world systems. So it's a matter of understanding what works and what doesn't and what ultimately is the goal. And so what is the goal is the one thing that uh, especially our circles need to be cohering into more and more. And what the goal is that comes from who are we, what are we doing, and where are we going? So it's like yeah. we can't answer those questions. And those are living questions. They're not just yeah. something that we yeah. resolve and agree on and we codify and then we have the dogma. It's like every day it's like who am I? And that's the felt sense of like thisness, like the this experience now and who am I in relation to everyone else and what do we want together? And so from there we start building. So, you know, I could probably issue some like statements of what, how I think things should be, but honestly, I think it's the inquiry of some of these important questions at the forefront, calibrating to them and then moving forward with that. Because some people want to live in collectives. Other people want yeah. to be independent. Um, some people can be entrepreneurs in a strictly capitalistic sense in a, let's just say in a fabled free open market, right? They just want yeah, to be yeah. entrepreneurs and like, that's cool. Like I have those, some of those proclivities. There are other people who just want to, you know, be, do less and be part of a collective, you know, and if someone says, well, that's communism. No, no, it's not. That's another fallacy. Like it's just yeah. like the two, the two false dichotomies, like capitalism and, and communism. It's like, no, let's start thinking differently. It's not wrong to want to have some sort of equal treatment and community. It's not wrong to want to have independence and to use your, you know, Faustian spirit to like achieve great things in this beautiful realm. But let's start merging these two because right now we have the these old systems of control that just keep putting each, they just keep playing the game of polarity, right? It's like this yeah. or that extreme. It's like, no, none of those. Right. Thank you. So the <laughs> question is like, what do we want to do? And not all of us are the same. So yeah, all I'm saying is there's a lot to figure out. A hundred percent. And I mean, this is, you know, this is the whole thing, right? Is it's like, you know, there's, there's this um, very mental, I, 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 you know, maybe unfairly, I, I say it's it's almost a form of brainwashing. There's there's been a there's been an es, a, you know an essence of brainwashing that has occurred in my mind um, when it comes to the protection of our existing ways. And the brainwashing comes by saying, well, anything that sounds like socialism, anything that sounds like communism, is inherently evil. And just don't even go there. If it if it sounds at all like it, just stay away from it. And but what does that do? That that pulls us back into accepting what is right. And, um, you know, obviously the reality of the situation is, is there's many ways of, of you know, coming up with something that um, would be better or would be different. And, and yet that dialogue's being shut down um, by almost like fear of a boogeyman. And, and it's, uh, it's very interesting to sort of watch. And, um, you know, I, I go back to this and, and, and I'm curious your, your take on this, but do you, have, do you find that you know, an emergent quality of being in a more slowed down, embodied, and say connected, maybe even go as far to say that left and right hemisphere of our brain is more integrated. Do you find an emergent quality is that we automatically can kind of sense that what we're doing now doesn't make sense and we're significantly more open to exploring other possibilities? Like, do you, do you see that as a quality? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's the prime quality that we need to be cultivating now because it's, you know, it's not some complex, complex, esoteric spiritual practice. It's a very, very reasonable, practical reality of cohering those those two. And yes, slowing down so that we can hear the signal of who we are, of what our natural desires are, natural intentions are. Because if we are playing the fast game of um, being in our minds and processing what the latest news and then whatever the cultural programs are we are we can't make new choices and we make we can't take holistic action we can only process mm -hmm. um based on the the rules of the game that is culturally viable at the moment and so that's that's why we don't have this is where we lack vision like vision comes from an embodied inspiration and an understanding which emerges through that slowing down and the trust that I can actually allow myself to do quote unquote nothing, which means 
I'm not hustling towards some goal of some satisfaction in the future through some achievement or validation or whatever it is. We 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 know what that feels like. We all know what that game feels like because it moves through our bodies most of the most of the day, right? It's like some yeah. some sort of goal in the future of some resolution. No, it's like that is just a busy static uh, again. And we do, we need to slow down to tune into what's real and to get that real inspiration, real vision, real knowing. And it's not, that's not like something that's distant. It's available at yeah. all times. Yeah. Like we've all had some experiences of it. And the more we touch that space, it's like, oh, okay, I can learn to trust these insights and these intuitions. And then like, there's depth and groundedness to this. And I can act from here, you know, from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I definitely think that that like you're speaking my language and I also want to play devil's advocate here because I kind of want to get to the crux of a hard problem um, but 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 just to, to mirror back it's like I, I definitely agree in, in that even that concept of what's here what's emerging let's say from the heart um, can be from a conceptual point of view can be perceived different ways right we might say well the heart looks like this um, but maybe we're just thinking about it that way, right? Versus when we become from an embodied place, you can actually feel and sense what is emerging from the heart a little bit more experientially. Um, but with that said, uh, this is kind of where I want to bring in um, the devil's advocate view. It is, it's like it's almost like it's saying, you know, those that might be just interested in the the playing the game that exists now, um, where they they want to just be that entrepreneur, they want to just you know eventually build up their wealth to hit a certain point or whatever like they just want to play that game and, and maybe that's authentic to them right um would you say that that then they're not tapping into that deeper space within themselves like as in if an emergent quality is we recognize that something's wrong with what we're doing those that don't recognize that there's something wrong are they are they not tapped in as is the question if they don't recognize something is wrong, are they not tapped in? Something is wrong. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, there's like all these things I almost want to like us to define for me to answer that, but it's not necessary. Like I would, in general, I would say yes, but also I'd like to just clarify my understanding of someone who's like uh, an entrepreneur that's running a business and wants to achieve a certain goal. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Like that could actually come from inner coherence. And I think that is happening. And I think that's where the future of business and actually like actual change in the world will happen is by high functioning human beings who are in tune with their, with are embodied, are in tune with the greater field so that they, they have the conceptual and willpower to execute in the world, but are connected to what is the, the emerging harmony culturally, right? And then they're able and we collect, because this is not going to be, I think this is more of a, individuated humans coming together so it's a collective of individuated humans not a collective yep. of unconscious slaves collective <laughs> of individuated humans right who are cohered integrated more and more um who will then be able to create new new systems that that actually have this greater flow uh of I'm sort of cornering myself here verbally, but ultimately will be vessels of, of greater generativity instead yeah. of a zero sum, sum game that is isolated for their own profit. So yeah. I've, I venerate that skill to be able to do that in an industrial scale. So let's see. Yeah, and I would, I would agree with that assessment 100%. It's more so the question of, um, you know, let's say the people that are not even interested in the sense of, of inquiring deeply about our existing society like that that are that are there to protect that are, you know it, it's that individual can can come across successful can come across like they're in, they're inspired and whatever but they're they're playing a game and, and again I'm, I'm working this out as a hard problem right is it's like um they're there they're, they're just like they want to play that game and they're fully invested in that game but that game is destructive it's it's it, the, an endogenous quality of that game is that it's it's destructive however it it feels like it's easy to say ah, that person just hasn't awakened to that truth yet however that also feels a little icky to do and so i'm, I'm curious how you would uh, expand on that yeah i know i don't know that there's a hard answer to that because with this emerging field of even you know like the whole thing of like us being entrepreneurs in the social sphere there's like influencers and influencers with let's say an influencer with good intentions initially 
just by virtue of the algorithm of Instagram or Facebook has to post a number, a certain amount of content periodically, therefore diluting what they have to say, therefore exaggerating what they actually know, therefore maybe turning into plagiarism and like being like just overstepping their yeah. grounded, you know, wisdom. And all of a sudden yeah. that person is now playing a game that they didn't want to play, but they have to because they have to survive and, and keep growing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, yeah. like this person came with good intentions. I'm, I'm in service of this transformational time and, uh, and, and, and our reality. And now my ego at some point subverted it all. And I'm like really enjoying the spoils of, of celebrity and being the one who knows it all. And, and, and yeah, so we have to like, I think there's compassion for that, but there also should be some like, you know, like, Hey, but like, you know, like, straighten yeah. up like you know we we can calibrate each other to the people that we know and yeah it's it's a tough one um to navigate it is tough yeah because the existing game dynamics would suggest that that person has to sort of become that to some extent to to win at the game and to have the attention and if you're not playing the game and this like this is a you know obviously like the more specifics we can get into with this discussion the more clear it is but but the general idea is that it feels as though because i've been through this a million times in in looking at how our you know collective evolution initially came out at a time where the market wasn't incredibly saturated with people saying the same stuff that that we were saying right and so it's like there was a time where it was like it was fresh we were like the the place that that was that was doing it and there was a few others but there wasn't a lot and now it's like the saturation levels are so immense that the competition has increased dramatically and the game dynamics are incentivizing everybody to just cut corners, produce more drama, produce more um, cynicism, right? Um, you know, hijack people's attention. And, and I'm sitting here going, man, I don't want to do that. But as I say that to myself, I'm also watching, man, my reach is, is declining. My, my revenue as a result is declining. So it's like either I have to start playing some of these cheapened game dynamics or and and that's you know that's a legit question that that you that you face. Yeah. And yeah, I want to touch upon that, right? It's an interesting again, very very interesting emergent like uh, dynamics here because at that point like do you leverage some drama while if you can honestly and authentically inoculate that with actual, you know, like meaning there and and solution based um, you know, like journalism and information or do you stay on like some sort of like hard integrity and sort of like risk falling away to the wayside to some people that are genuinely interested in solutions, but missing out on like some of the mainstream. So like, this is where these tactics are very interesting. And, but we always have to be harmonizing. Like, who are we? Yeah. Who am I? What am I doing? Where am I going every yeah. day? And it's like, if we don't have that, then we get lost in the game. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I think, I, again, I, I kingdom keep coming up in my mind. Like we, we, we should get to that and talk about that a little bit. But I have maybe one more um, sort of question before we dive into that. And it's and it's about art, right? It's about um, this idea that sometimes it feels like I look at in shadow. I look at kingdom, and I and I see this, you know, sort of meaningful portrayal of the nature of our world today. And you're, you're trying to say something, but in my opinion, you're skillfully saying it. You're doing it in a way that, that just captures enough of a little bit of everybody that it's relatable. Um, but but the, sometimes these types of forays into creating art that is maybe has a hopeful ending or maybe is ha trying to say something, it can be almost like, no, it, it, like that's not, don't do that. Like just be cynical, just like, just play the game of, of, you know, whatever, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's almost like it's yeah. easier sometimes to create meaningless. And I, and I hate saying this, in, you know, for lack of a better word, it's easier sometimes to create meaningless work um, yeah. because it might get more attention or it might. Um, but when you're trying to drive something deeper, uh, you know, and I feel like that's what art has kind of become. It, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's sort of lessened, at least what we see in the pop culture. It's, it's like, it's been, it's been plasticized, right? And um, I'm curious your thoughts on that when you look at the art world yourself and you consider what you've created. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it's such, such a big question with art and, you know, just like full transparency, I'm not following the art world very much. So I just kind of do what I want to do and that's that. Yeah. But um, yeah, in general, I know what you mean. The thing is, with I know it within me when I when I've when I've worked in 
in the animation business and writing my own stories and stuff like that. Like if there was no real, like if we were still in the nineties, you know, like living what we thought was the world and this is how it is. And we're just like enjoying modern life and entertainment. Like I'd be making a lot of those kind of stories because I just want to do character portraits. I want to do little dramas. What if scenarios of things going just very bad. And that's just that like, those are fun things to explore as a storyteller for me and my personal sort of uh my my kind of like uh soul impulse is like oh fuck all right i gotta i gotta put this stuff in service to something greater because like we're in a crisis and like i can't just be making my own entertainment and you know enjoying that it just doesn't feel right for me uh you know bless everyone else that feels fulfilled doing that i think that's great um and so the challenge then is like well, we want to present something. Sometimes you want to present something bleak to shock an audience into a realization and then into action. And you know, I've shared with yeah. you my other film, The Forest King, which is not out. It should be out soon as well. It's part of another series. You know, that's you know, a conversation for another day. And that's a bleak one, and that ends pretty bleakly. And there's a purpose to that because it's a cautionary tale. The purpose of that is to yeah. shake the person out of a stupor of like the logical conclusion of this technocratic creep and, and kneeling and being a subservient to greater and greater infringements of your liberty, freedom, and free will leads to this kind of conclusion, right? And it's like, deal with deal with that. <laughs> and then there's other things with Kingdom in which I had this impulse to be, you know, to, I've done my own, sh I've done plenty of shadow work, shadow revelation, collective and personal, by no means is it finished, but enough so that I reached a point years ago during the COVID uh, period when I was like, we just need inspiration, vision, and an infusion of something greater to start coming in. Yeah. Now, that in art is not easy to do. Of course, in traditional and classical art, that's the majority of what it was. It's these aspirational, idealized images of uh, humanity, whether it was through bodily proportions of, of the idealized strength of a channel of the divine, you know, ratios and the temples and the cathedrals and the the, the the very like just these concrete instances of divine you know like resonance right but we've lost that because modern modernity is a fallen uh, you know culture from classical traditions which were yeah. aligned based on a more divine hierarchy maybe corrupt whatever but there was that impulse so yeah. because we don't have that impulse now we don't have we're not aligned to beauty and to harmony we're aligned to yeah. chaos and disarray and so that's reflected in the way that we, the artists, the storytellers, the corporate storytellers and Netflix and, you know, all these other places that that's what they know and that's what they create for the market. So it's like, how many of us know how to live an inspired life? Well, look at social media and even all the, you know, the coastal mega cities of like, just like, let's say California and New York, who sort of dominate cultural dialogue. It's like, there's a hate and a belligerence toward regular people. There's a sort of like antipathy and a contempt to, to a lot of like, just like regular good values. And there's a lot of moral posturing. So there's no real constructive generative art, even just from these creators who are like hating on population as a whole. So like, how can they create something inspiring when they're not even in touch with that, when they can only, you know, virtue signal to, to go into cliche. So what I'm saying ultimately is like, it's no, it's not easy to go into feelings of inspired art right now because we have to be inspired humans ourselves yeah. first, right? And so we have to do the work. And for me with Kingdom, trying to lean into that a little bit, it's not like it's some inspiring piece by any means. It's like, it's my version of it right now where I'm at. And the, the, as much of the heroic and courageous impulse that I could pull, pull out within me that I could visualize at this stage. Um, you know, just with the budget and means that I've had at my disposal. And so, um, yeah, I wouldn't, like, it's much easier to have a bleak worldview. It's, it's definitely easier to do. I know it because every time I write, I can write that much more easily than try to do something aspirational and inspirational without it having be cheesy. Cause that's a, a, the, yeah. the other great danger, right? Yeah. Is like, so anyway, I'll leave it at that. I said a whole bunch of stuff, but yeah. 
no, there's definitely a sense of cheesiness that can arise from that for sure. And, yeah. um, you know, I think just to go back to that embodied, that sort of the nervous system, I, you know, I think back to this, this thing I created, the physiology of sense making and the, the purpose of it was just to kind of lay out this idea that when we are embodied and, and in a sense of safety and there's, there's physiological markers that could tell you that that's happening, um, you, this is where our greatest creativity, this is where, you know, our sense of connection to spirit, our, our sense of connection to something uh, beyond ourselves emerges, right? Reliably. And I, I use the term reliably because there's, I've heard stories of people having a very deep, you know, sense of sacredness from a very terrible event, right? Um, and, but, but these kind of happen sometimes, right? But if you were to create a reliable space um, from a day-to-day -day perspective to, to sort of tap in and tune into these sorts of things, um, there's a ideal physiological place to be, right? And that's kind of uh, sort of, I think, the idea. And so when we think of our world and how stressed out it is and how everybody is like just pushed to the max all the time and we're following social media and following and we're always, you know, disconnected out here, um, the, we're almost always existing in stress physiology. And this is, I think, part of w how we then have this like reciprocal relationship between feeling stressed out and then creating uninspired or I don't want to say uninspired like in a way where I'm putting down work I'm, I'm just trying to find the word where um, it might be the attack like the attacks the virtue signaling right like this stuff comes from sort of this emptiness um, that we feel right so it becomes this sort of uh, reciprocal relationship but um, I just kind of wanted to, to add that to what you were saying because that's kind of what emerged as a thought um, I do want to see if we can maybe Maybe you want to touch on that first before we jump into kingdom. Did you want to add anything to that? Mm, yeah, I think th I'll just add something brief briefly. Like, yeah, because we don't have a um, societal structure of values and virtues, like I was saying earlier, and it's yeah. all performative, which is why what should have been it, which is like the idea of liberal culture, and I don't mean politically. I just mean in the in the in the truest sense of just like being one who stands for liberty and all that that entails these open traits like that it's just so performative right like we've it's been it's yeah. just so exposed at this point and anyone who's still playing that game is sort of just taking on these traits for playing the social game and, and there's a lot of unconsciousness there so in light of that yeah there's there isn't like there's just it's difficult to one has to c come up really come up with their own values and live by them consistently in order mm -hmm. to to come out of that muck otherwise yeah. we're kind of lost in in this uh, chaotic moment in time culturally yeah. yeah and so i guess that is a sort of segue into kingdom which is the the next film i you know i watched this one and you know i see some similar symbolism to in shadow but there's a very different story very much more uh, timely and relevant let's dive right into it. What is the story being told in, uh, in kingdom story being told in kingdom? Yes. So kingdom came out of, um, of a moment of real visceral embodied actually, uh, indignation, right? And that indignation came from my own, my own spirit and my own, uh, whenever I can tap into my warriorhood, in this case, the artistic warriorhood, uh, of me furiously scribbling on the screen until I finish this animation. <laughs> uh, but it's it's the story of, um, of of one human who dares to to get up, get to face his own darkness, get up from his knees, remove the blindfolds of uh, true seeing and true self-expression, and to to walk courageously to pick up the the courage of uh, of his divine right. And to become a conduit of the of the higher transcendent realms mm -hmm. of uh, of that quote God uh, source God energy, and to amplify that as a conduit uh, to serve as an inspiration for all other fellow humans, brothers and sisters, who can then fly find their own flame, their own inner internal flame of the one light within us all, and to collectively at last face this collective aberrant shadow, um, this dark uh, adversarial, mythical and real energy and transform it with a new vision coming out of clarity and alignment. <laughs> that's, that's not, you know, 
Yeah. Very small idea there, that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. You yeah, know, thanks. You know, yeah, go on. Is it, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say, thanks for asking me to recount that. I don't think I've summed it up in that way. That was interesting to say and to hear. <laughs> it, yeah. I mean, it certainly matches the story. I mean, um, you know, let's, I, I, we can break it down a little bit. It's, it's like you see this image of all these people with blindfolds and, and, um, and let's say mouth coverings. I don't want to say masks per se, but maybe that's what it is. And, um, and you know, this fear, there's a fear around them and there's a, there's a, there's a fear that is, is, is being used to kind of block our eyes and block our, um, our, our expression. And, um, but at some point, th this guy does pull down the, his, his eye covering and he suddenly starts to see. And, and there's this really visceral moment in the film of not only the suits being upset that he's pulling down, but everybody else is looking at him. And um, yeah, unpack that one a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, right. It's like when someone dares to see clearly, it, it, it sends a shockwave around everyone else who's playing this game of pretend. And like, dude, why are you disrupting this flow we have? It may be miserable, but it's what we know. <laughs> yes. And we don't want any uncertainty now. But it's also like the other thing of like looking back at the person who's doing that is like, oh, shit, they're going for it. Like, can I do that? Uh, what would it take for me to do that? Do I want to? It's too much trouble. Or it's like, I really want to. How? I don't know. How did they do it? You know? Um, yeah, and then, yeah. yeah, of course, it's also a threat to to the puppets. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, he he takes it off and he starts walking towards this this sword, um, which it, which I, I believe and correct me if I'm wrong here. It's it's sort of that symbolism, that light sword that's in the ground, um, sort of being held at the base by by this dark sort of slimy stuff. Um, that is that is the the source wisdom. That is the the sacred. That is taking up your sacred knowledge, connection, so on and so forth. But yeah, that part was um, so. Just to zoom out a little bit, I didn't intend to make this film. I started drawing. I wanted it to be a 30-second short that I was going to put on Instagram. But then it kept growing and growing and growing, and it turned into a 14-minute film. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so initially, that Dark Knight of the Soul was not in there. But as I kept drawing, you know, I usually am more meticulous in planning stuff and of course intuition always weaves in this was much more of a straight ahead kind of thing i would just sit in front of my desk and start drawing and piecing things together and and i like that rough around the edges kind of feel that, that that ultimately came out so the dark night of the soul was not initially there but then it felt so weird it felt like a great spiritual bypass for him to just sort of like get up from his knees and walk to the sword and pick yeah. it up without like really going inward and of course, me, myself, in the last year, I was going through some purification and working with some denser aspects in myself. And that one part actually helped me, as all personal art should do, and also art for the others, is came from a real place of me purifying myself. And um, it's, uh, yeah, he, he faces, uh, he faces his, his inner shadow, his, in a way, his dark doppelganger, and purges a lot of this collective darkness and energy which i experienced during COVID, that was infecting a lot of people in the form of like neo boy neo girl mm -hmm. you know just moving in neo to the narrative absorb and amplify the message that we give you like that very mm -hmm. like i was really feeling that in my body and collectively and so him he was he's purging all that just just that collective sludge that asks you to be part of this aber like degenerate collective mm -hmm. and then of course he through all of that, by creating the will, courage, and presence, and capacity to face and hold that darkness, he uncovers the most precious aspect that is available to him at that point, which is the inner child, and this this inner complex of of disowned emotions, fears, sorrows that he fully embraces in order to open his heart and yeah. open to to the the truth of who he is which then gives him the courage to get off of his knees yeah. and to move forward through adversity to claim his birthright you know then yeah. to raise it with the collective yeah <laughs> yeah and now that you explain it it's all coming back in the right order but <laughs> you know but um but yeah the uh, you know the thing that i love too as you were kind of describing that journey and then i remember the the faces of, of people turning towards him with their mouths um i you know very almost like teeth 
teeth being bare, you know, mouths like yelling at him, like, stop, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, don't go down this. And the politicians or the suits, if you will, are urging people to go and yell at him for um, doing that. And, you know, I just think about, for me, the, 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 the emerging feeling in my body was the Freedom Convoy. Um, and uh, this moment of, uh, it, you know, I, because I was so closely linked to this thing where it, it inspired me at the beginning when it started to happen, but I was there for, you know, our, our, between myself and other members of our team, we were there for the entire thing from start to finish with the exception of two days. And, um, and to be so close to it and, and, and to be on the ground where you're, I, like I'm firsthand experiencing stuff, but I'm watching the media and the politicians say something else that is completely not true. And they're saying this and they're getting the rest of the collective to attack everybody who's down there on the ground. And I, the, the, that's what came up for me when I was watching that. Just the, it was such a perfect, the politician says, here's who you should go attack. Those people go, okay, I'll go do that. And they'll attack it. And it's all based on lies. And I just thought that was so well done, that, that mm. particular piece. Thanks, man. I'm glad you felt that. Because, yeah, I mean, that a lot of kingdom was inspired by that moment in time, actually. I was at that point yeah. living in Peru. I was far away from what was happening in Canada. I had left Canada because of the uncertainty of what was happening and the readiness with which people were giving away their freedom, the overall illiteracy and parapolitics and then, and, and, you know, like centralized governance, people like you and I, we had put in our 10,000 hours already into this like research. So we knew like, you know, from the beginning, it's like, ah, they're doing this and that. All right. So in a year from now, we're probably going to get the mandates, like all that stuff we knew. So like I had put, you know, I had planned some things. I just wasn't sure how far I was going to go. So from, from Peru, seeing all this happen, I had, um, you know, just that, indignation of anyone who, who who cares for truth and integrity does and um during COVID, i was very busy with different projects that you know the forest king i was directing he man before that i wasn't able to do to my personal life to to invest into an art piece that was needed then and so after hours after my full-time job i was like man i just i just feel this impulse i'm going to do this little thing which then spiraled into 14 minutes so that dynamic that you sensed of him walking through the people who are bell like belligerent toward him to be like, just adopt, just come back to the construct, just come back to the construct, yeah. stop being, what are you doing rising up? <laughs> you know, what are you doing being free and seeing um, and noticing? Um, and so that came directly from there. So that's exactly the impulse I was, I was conveying actually. Uh, and I just want to say, this is not COVID specific. This film, this, this film is yeah. specific to everything we've been going through and we will be going through. Uh, it just, you know, there are nuggets from there because so much was emblem instantiated, emblemized and exemplified through the COVID moment and group psychology and in just the, the collective journey. Yeah. I mean, COVID was, was just one of those moments where, it was just such a mirror. It was such a visceral, loud, aggressive mirror for the state of the human condition. Let's just say it's society, ourselves, everything, our, our relationship with government, our relationship with authoritarianism, our relationship with, let's say, the lack of the sacred. Um, it was just, it was just unbelievable. The, the, the reductionism, the um, it was just such a loud mirror that I don't think you could have ignored it unless you did everything in your power to to ignore it or maybe you weren't exposed to other ideas um because i've never seen a time where let's say um, more um for, for the for lack of a better term uh, like everyday people uh just people that that don't pay attention to indie media at all they just live their lives they're working professionals all these sorts of things whatever a huge chunk of those people were like nah something's wrong here um, academics, scientists, um, people that are, that are deep in the rigor of not only have gone through a training that really um, sort of takes their expertise and ties it to the existing system in such a, a valuable way, but even those people were feeling, no, something's wrong here, right? So they had to overcome that, that training, that, that entrenchment into the system and say, no, this has to break. And, and that was happening at such a big level. And so it was very, very powerful moment. But when I hear you talk about a lot of this stuff, it seems like you're going a lot from your own feelings, from your own uh, embodiment. So, so is, is it fair to say that 
you look to your own path of, of sensing and feeling, whether it be pain or healing, in how you create the symbolism and imagery in the films? Absolutely, first and foremost. Yeah, so that's a good observation. First and foremost, because if I wasn't doing that and I was going by something external to me, like a book I had read or, and of course those things all, you know, they, they are part of who I am. But if I was just going based on someone else's interpretation that I was inspired by, I would not be able to carry a project from beginning to end with all the sacrifices and discipline required to do mm -hmm. so. It would have to, like it's always, whenever I finish something like this, and now I've done it two and a half times in Shadow and Kingdom are very personal. Yeah. Forest King is still personal, but you know, I that was I was commissioned to do that, so there was more of a incentive as in like I was making a living from it. And um yeah, I wouldn't be able to carry something through if I wasn't like viscerally feeling it. Yeah. I mm -hmm. totally, totally get that. And that's actually yeah. been one of the things that I personally struggled with when uh when going through sort of the, the downturn or the downfall of our business, which was manufactured by the existing system out there in a sense and um and then and then going through a place of burnout and i noticed in that place of burnout I, I i couldn't find what was sacred i couldn't find what was me i couldn't find what was spiritual and and it was hard to do because there was a sense of i don't even know why or what i'm doing it's just it's coming out and and i think in many ways through some of those years i was drawing upon my my mental remembrance of all of the content I had created and all of the um, the memories and all the things that I had that sort of built and designed over the years because nothing ever fully goes away. It's more just less efficient, significantly less efficient, right? Um, and uh, and yeah, it was very hard to, to do a lot of inspiring projects because there was the lack of that driving energy, that driving motivation, and uh, it was that was that was a palatable thing at that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I. I did you want to touch on that? No, I just wanted to commend you because I know I know your journey and what you've shared with me, you know, since we've known each other for, you know, for some time now. And like, just want to commend you on just like walking steadfastly on that path and and pivoting where you, you needed to based on what you felt was most expedient and important. And, you know, like, it's amazing. And just your, your transparency and speaking about the whole process of, you know, running this this enterprise which has inspired many people has informed them over the years and then just this, the changing landscape of it all and managing yeah making sense of what is the best way to serve i just want to say much respect on you you know walking the path without being rigid in a certain direction because you're playing a certain game your game yeah. seems to be like what is most real and most helpful right now yeah beautiful yeah thank you so much for sharing that and i you know it's it's funny be, right before we jumped on this i I got this like impulse, which, you know, follow your impulse, right? Um, to just, I was gonna make a video titled, you know, what happened to me um, over the last, you know, couple of years or whatever. And I, I had written out a whole bunch of what would be the, just the general ideas. And it was to kind of share this journey from the standpoint of like, you know, the, the ups and downs of it and, and put it out on the channel because a lot of people were like, hey, where'd you go for the last like couple of years? <laughs> it's like, maybe, maybe it'll be helpful to, to share the story. and. Um, and likewise, I want to commend you for, you know, what you've created, not only an in shadow back in the day, which, you know, has touched millions of people, but, you know, the other projects that you've now more recently created and just the idea of putting something that I think is so raw and visceral out that is that is very much a part of you um, in service of other people sort of sensing and feeling and being able to reflect is, again, to me, what I what I admire is you're, you're bringing to art a message that I believe is so sacred right now. There, even even in the sort of the dystopian feel of some of the the imagery, there's still a sacredness that that it, that is that emerges that I believe people need to really come in contact with, and and I think that happens through your work. So so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So those those beautiful acknowledgments out of the way, I want to <laughs> share. <laughs> I want to go into one of the pieces that um, I think in, has inspired me most that I'm so glad you have in this new film. Um, and it, and it's, it's just been something that's been such a deep driver in our brand, but I don't see it a lot in other brands. And I think it's very powerful that you hold this. And it's that you took a lot of effort to not dehumanize 
the quote unquote, the elite, the people, the suits, the people in positions of power, you, you, you kept a very human, hey, let's consider their healing too. I, I'd love for you to expand on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as we, you know, the journey of unveiling uh, our filter of perception, seeing darkness, seeing mechanic mechanisms of control, initially it's a startling thing, right? And then we, we experience fear, disorientation, blame, accusation, and then even a vengeful spirit of like, how dare you? How could you? Mm -hmm. How could you be doing these terrible things? Like you need to be annihilated, expelled, whatever. And those are very normal mammalian things and just they also make sense expelling a threat but the the more that we develop in or inwardly and the more that we see the the greater game the more that we see despite our feelings of um revenge and self-righteousness we start seeing that we're all part of this one big system and the more that we learn about the influences on all human beings and all the kind of mechanical almost deterministic forces on people who don't do inner work we can start feeling more compassion and even if we can't feel the compassion we can be strategic and be like maybe i don't feel the compassion but i can see the greater game and let me lean into a bit more mercy and a bit more hope that we can transform and you know i by no means harbor any illusions of a big kumbaya moment for all of us transforming but I can allow myself the luxury of exploring this in art where I can have a fantasy and I can put out a vision of a holistic resolution to it all. Because in art, we can and should have that in our myths so that we can then aspire to them and calibrate to them often enough so that we can bring that into our daily life and into our world. So, you know, as most of the film, like I shared, that part wasn't in there. And I, I had the impulse of like, like, fuck you guys, essentially, even though I know better, you know, and in my moments of clarity. But of course, the COVID moment was was just so idiotic in so many ways. Uh, there was so much willful ignorance, so much willful malice, you know, just straight up. And I'm being charitable here. When I'm expressing this. You know? <laughs> so like, we could be much more colorful in our condemnation of the moment. Um, and of course, compassionate. Yeah. Too. It's a big game. But in that moment, you know, again, that warrior masculine spirit that emerges in me sometimes and when it comes to righteous indignation and stuff like that and in real injustice I was like, fuck you guys. Like, <laughs> like, let's fucking go with the sword, you know? Yeah. And at the same time, it takes an even bigger person to be like, to father that. You know, speak again yeah. from me as a man. To, to father that situation and to hold that bigger container of like, not only are we going to cut down what is wrong, but we're also going to transform what is aberrant and we can going to bring that sick branch back into the tree. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I had a moment of um, I was highly caffeinated one morning in Peru drawing this stuff and I was just like scribbling. And I as part of my creative process. Sometimes I don't drink coffee all the time, but coffee, loud music that's inspirational that evokes emotion. And I just started drawing these suits so just like writhing and like um you know like squirming and being purified and i started crying and um yeah exactly. usually for me that's a great metric uh, qualifier of what is true yeah. and real and i was like dang okay this is inevitable yes i feel it it's like it's almost like through that process i process some of that some of that contempt that i was feeling for the adversaries who were also stuck in their systems and their games and I started processing some of some of that for myself. And also I saw that through art, maybe we could collectively process by that episode of their purging, their clearing, their purification. The more of us that witness that, perhaps we start in the morphogenetic field, allowing for that process to occur for real, right? Now we're like, there's a, a at least an allowance of mercy. Like, hey, we can all clear ourselves from this. We're all complicit to some degree in all this madness that is happening. And so my hope is that art can once again function as a spell of white magic to allow that space to allow for that clearing to happen yeah. even for those people that we would never imagine they could happen for so yeah. that's that's the aspiration here yeah that's beautiful and and you know i think this is part of the message that um that has always been hard for people to palette um, when, when it's brought up, whether it's, you know, from other 
um, traditions that have talked about this kind of thing. I mean, you know, Gandhi and uh, turn the other cheek, so to speak, from, from Jesus and, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and I think, I think the idea is there's a, I, I often put it like when people were so mad at Trudeau, for example, right? It's like, look, you can, can you, can you see that you don't like Trudeau's behavior, but still understand that he's a divine being in himself in the sense that he's still a soul having an experience like so it's it's just a it's just a reflective exercise right it's it's an exercise of can you can you say no i don't like the behavior and i'm not going to stand for the behavior but not forego all of your energy and hatred and malice like you know what i mean say like not not just give it all away um by holding on with such deep hate right can in, in essence can you still hold him as both things right um, and this, of course, is very hard for people to do, and they'd be like, well, what does that lead towards, right? And, and I think your film sort of touches upon what that can lead towards. And um, you, I think you pointed out, you know, you don't think there's going to be this kumbaya moment. And I would agree, there's probably not going to be a kumbaya <laughs> moment. However, you know, even drawing upon my, um, my, my training in sort of the nervous system, trauma space, all that kind of stuff, I mean, it, it's very common. You don't need to uh, go back to your abuser, per se, and... Um, and, and rectify the situation after you've been healed or to, to finish your healing. That's not necessary in the process. You can do this internally. And I do, first off, on one hand, think that there's, there's, you are going to be healed in that, in that sense. But there's also this morphic field of, in essence, I think that, that, that connection is now severed in terms of the way that pain was going back and forth between the, the person who had, who had done something to us. And I, I think, in my own sense of it, it also frees up the role to some extent that they, they play. Uh, and now we're talking from a very non-dual sort of perspective here. So we're kind of going down the depths. I have these depths that I like to play with of, of like, you know, we, we can view the world just from the facts. We can view the world from a systems sort of behavioral lens. And then we can ask what is driving? What is the, what is the consciousness? What is the sacredness that's driving the upper layers of depths there? And then we can go all the way to the non-dual where we get to this place of like, oh my gosh, there's, there's this like, when we have these mystical experiences, we recognize that what's happening in the world is, is so like, it, it, like it's perfect. And, and, it, and, and we have to talk about that because people have those experiences, right? But then they come back to the, to the real world, if you will, and they go, well, what the hell do I do with that now? Right. And we have to integrate that. And so, so I, I saw, you know, in the way you ended that, I saw that I saw all of, you know, what I just kind of summed up there in that ending. And I hope um, that it's inspiring to people because I, I think there is a lot of wasted energy. Yes, a boundary has been crossed by these people uh, in a sense that we need to say, okay, what are we going to do? And, and let's, let's make sure that we don't allow this to continue. But there's so much energy being wasted yeah. in the way you know, so many of us are approaching that, that situation. Big time. I think that's a very important point is the energy being wasted because that's like, it's basically being trauma fixated, right? It's uh, mm -hmm. carrying resentment for a past occurrence, which m may have been and very much was probably wrong. And here, I mean, just personal, collective, whatever. But at the end of the day, the person experiencing that and being deeply hurt by it, we would hope is becoming more and more transformed into a greater version of themselves. And the, basically, the more that we stay in that mentality of we were wronged, it truly is a victim mentality. That doesn't mean that what happened wasn't wrong. It just means that we're, we continually choose to recreate that memory and ascribe the same values to it every new moment of this existence. And is that, like, is that, a, is that really a wise approach? I'm not saying I don't do that, but is it wise? Because I know when I catch myself in it and I see those energy leaks, instead of using them generatively for my fulfillment, for the creation of my life and the beautifying of life of those around me, and just for the flourishing of the realm overall, I'm just spending that energy in some like loops of repetitive resentment. Like that's, let's face it, we all do it, but it's like it's low level activity, mm -hmm. like no need. Yeah. Now, to be constructive, let's say we're not, I'm not saying, and neither are you, I'm sure, we're, we're going to forget any of this, right? It's not yeah. about forgetting. It's about learning the lesson, fortifying greater like agency, greater wisdom, and 
will for to act accordingly in a certain situation, greater vigilance towards certain kind of behaviors and traits that we may may see as a as a threat, so we can pick them up quicker. And also a, a more empowered self who is focused on vision and generativity. So, yeah, that's that's and that's what Kingdom actually says. Also, is uh, yeah. you know, and uh, again, Kingdom is a, is an extension of me and also my inspiration. And that's been my process as well. It's ultimately it's taking full control, full full responsibility for my complete experience, regardless mm -hmm. of the circumstances. The circumstances are the circumstances, but I, like I said, every new moment is a new moment in time. And therefore, it's a new redeemable gift in which I can choose a new. And if I'm not choosing a new, I'm bringing back the old. And therefore, I'm ruled by some magic spell from the past, which I'm allowing to zap my energy. Again, like, is that the person I want to be? Or do I want to be the magician in this moment who is weaving his reality and choosing the influences upon my system? Or am I leaking my energy to some, you know, goblin energy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well very very well said and and i you know i 100 percent agree and um i really liked how you also sort of tied in the the victim uh, mentality there and, and kind of what happens and um it's an i think this is what what humanity is processing at the end of the day is um is that nuance around we've been wronged and let's say you know in essence we're still being wronged um, but it's part of this human condition piece that it, the, the ways in which can we empathize the ways in which it's unfolding and um, can we energize and not allow that life force to sort of be lost so much in, in the victimhood um, because it, it just kind of goes on forever and, and there's not a lot of productive change. We end up having change that is very authoritarian, that is very controlling, that is very, you know, I need to keep everything as safe and in control as humanly possible. So now you can't do that. And, you know, we, we, we become very, um, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's, to be honest, it's kind of the whole woke thing, right? I mean, that's, that's an example of, of trying to use authoritarianism to control what everybody can say, do or whatever. And we're, we're just policing everything. And this is not a, this is not an inspired state of healing. This is kind of like, I don't even want to feel my pain. So I'm making sure that you can't say anything that could potentially arise this feeling. So the pain is all still there. Um, but, but we're trying to put up barriers so that no one can say anything. And I think, I don't think that's a productive way forward, but um, I'd be curious if you have any sort of final thoughts on, on everything we've discussed, sort of a leaving message here um, to the, to the viewers. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, first I'm just feeling, uh, viscerally, there's a felt sense of gratitude and of this conversation. I feel, I'm, I'm feeling fulfilled in speaking to you. I think this was a, a great conversation. Really enjoyed your comments and your and your questions. Beyond that, if I may, um, I would just like to lately. This is most of what I've been saying. Is you know just based on the last five minutes of what we were discussing, carrying that through into everyday life is taking more and more radical responsibility for our perceptions and our actions and pivoting more from consumption to creation so balancing mm -hmm. the scales out and that means even whether it's playing with the kids doing a craft like that's creation too or it's you know planning a business or just visualizing you know the next next aspect of how beautiful life can be how beautiful family life can be or how beautiful the world can be uh so balancing creation and consumption consumption of content, consumption of other people's opinions and thoughts. And, uh, and through that, daring to rise into a vision. <laughs> so having a vision, and that vision is not just visual, it's a vision that, that spans all the senses. And that vision is of, can we start feeling into a more beautiful world, first for ourselves and those around us, and then for the world? If we can't do that, then we will simply ride what is presented for us. Yeah. If we don't understand that, then we're not playing the game. We're just consuming doom porn and entertaining ourselves. That's okay. But if we want to start playing and being constructive and stop, you know, start saying, what, what's the solution? I know it seems like to some people it may seem like, but that's not a solution. No, I'm sorry. That is actually the very beginning of a solution. <laughs> if you don't have a vision, if you're not acting out of principle, values, and moving into that space through your imaginal nobility, and you're just acting chaotically, throwing stones at the bad guys, like, you're not you're not an active player you're gonna get sniped like <laughs> yes <laughs> like you would right so, what a word. yeah so so just 
you know, I, I got a little contentious there, but ultimately bringing it back, centering is like, let's, let's just bring beauty and vision into our, our realm and the outer realm and then act accordingly. Small steps. <laughs> that's what I would say. Beauty. And that's, yeah. how, you, that's how you avoid getting sniped? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Avoid getting sniped by, by using uh, the right words and not the ones that are pattern match me. But yeah. yeah. Well, I've, I've been pattern matched. Let's, let's be real. Yeah, uh, that's true. Um, the, uh, yeah, and, you know, the, the jokes there, the jokes there were, were a great way to finish. Good laugh. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. thanks so much for taking the time to, to do this, to have this conversation. I was very, very much fulfilled and, and very enjoyed, um, you know, being able to kind of go to depths with this. So that's been a lot of fun. And uh, I'm, you know, looking forward to seeing the response to Kingdom when it, when it does come out. And yeah, just thanks so much for everything that you've been doing. And uh, yeah, appreciate you. Wonderful. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you too. All the best.